in that case, then we'll pass on to the next um, item on the agenda uh, on Bangladesh. And um, I wanted to say at the beginning that, you know, while it's the, the sort of the core item on the agenda today, um, we'd thought about having an exchange of views on this quite some time ago. So it's only a coincidence that actually it now comes up sort of a couple of weeks before we're actually due to go to Bangladesh. That, um, as some of you may know, we were, had been aiming to travel later in the year to Bangladesh, um, go elsewhere in February, but those dates for February for um, Sri Lanka didn't fit, so Bangladesh um, has very kindly stepped in to, um, you know, to help us out with that timetabling issue. So, and while we're in Bangladesh, we're not intending at all to focus on the war crimes trials once we're there, because those are trials which are in process. But uh, we do have a number of distinguished guests with us today um, from Dhaka and elsewhere, whom I'll present in a moment, um, to, to update us, I suppose, with, with the, the situation at the, at the moment. And we're also very grateful to the Ambassador for having changed her travel plans to be back with us today in order to be able to participate in the, the debate. That members will be aware that this year is the 40th anniversary um, of the, the war and the establishment of the state of Bangladesh, that um, the war followed on uh, to the, the victory of the then East, based, East Pakistan based Awami League in national elections, and the, certainly the response from the Pakistan government was to begin on March the 26th a very a massive military operation to arrest pro independence leaders and activists during which the estimates of the people killed during that conflict range from 300,000 up to 3 million. We all know how difficult it is to establish the numbers who die in conflict. So in response to this carnage, the parliament of the newly independent Bangladesh passed um, the International Crimes Tribunals Act in 1973, but trials were not initiated at, at that point. But the current Awami League government, however, amended the act in February of 2010 and set up special courts with a special prosecution team to address the crimes. And Bangladesh also ratified in March of that year, 2010, the Rome Statute on the International Criminal Court, a development which we warmly welcomed as a step forward in the international community's efforts to combat impunity for war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide to use the precise words of our High Representative and Vice President Catherine Ashton. The International Crimes Tribunal, the ICT, to judge those responsible um, for serious human rights abuses is now active. And since last November, charges have been pressed with some new high profile cases being opened very recently. At the same time, we're aware that Bangladesh applies the death penalty and the EU's complete opposition to this is both long-standing and well-known. And just as a reminder, the last statement, again from Baroness Ashton on the issue, was issued only three days ago and focuses on a case on Delaware in the United States of America. So cases under the ICT jurisdiction are mostly, as our understanding, capital punishment cases. And while we certainly welcome the government's commitment to bring justice, we also want to make sure that trials reach the highest possible standards. So it's a pleasure to welcome today a number of guests whose CVs are included um, in the dossier that's been distributed to everyone. Um, those guests include the ICT prosecutor, Mr. Um, Zaid Al Malung, Dr. Turin Afroz, an associate professor at the School of Law at Brack University and an advocate of the Supreme Court. Mr. Sharia Kabir, General Secretary of the Forum for Secular Bangladesh, former in Amnesty International Prisoner of Conscience. Dr. Peter Custers, whose dedication to Bangladesh is well known in this house. We also have Mr. Toby Cadman, an international criminal law specialist in the area of war crimes, instructed to represent some of the defendants. And of course, we have the Ambassador, Ambassador Ismat Jahan, the mission of Bangladesh to the European Union, and we also have with us Dr. Genevieve hernandez Uriz, the desk officer for Bangladesh in the External Action Service. 
So the purpose of the exchange of views this afternoon is for us to get a clearer grasp of current events in Bangladesh. We're certainly not a court. We don't aspire to being one. Um, so therefore, what we want to pro um, do is to try and keep the emphasis um, on the process, the background, the context, and not on the individuals facing trial. Um, I'd like to ask our speakers if they can, it's a short speaking time, but I mentioned parliamentarians usually get a minute. So we, for people speaking with our committee, we usually give maybe five minutes. So I think Dr. Custers, if you'd like to start, please. Thank you, Mrs. Uh, Chairperson of this uh, South Asian delegation. Uh, honorable Chairperson, honorable members of the European Parliament, uh, dear friends and dear participants. Um, of course, I'd like to start by expressing sincere gratitude to uh, the South Asian delegation for having given us the opportunity and the possibility to address this session. We are very happy that we have been able to grant the green light to come to address this session. And um, we are certainly very, very grateful to, to the delegation for that at this particular moment. Um, before uh, starting my, uh, my introductory talk, which has to be short, as the chairperson has already said, I would like to also sp speak out my thanks to Mr. Bikas Choduri Borwa. And I'm doing this in particular because as a citizen, conscious citizen of Bangladesh, he has helped to, to facilitate the entire effort. And without the voluntary efforts of many people from the diaspora in Europe, it would not have been possible to put uh, this, uh, this uh, process today together. Now, the chairperson has already introduced the Bangladeshi members of the delegation. And she has also set the tone uh, of, uh, of this uh, exchange of views by referring to the extreme gravity of the crimes that were committed in 1971. She has mentioned the number, the figures, which although they are varied regarding the number of people who died, even if we presume that the number of three million people might not be the precise figure, the fact that um, numbers have been circulated from up to 300,000 to 3 million for a period of simply nine months already indicates that we have a very, very grave case of human rights violations, of uh, crimes against humanity in the case of uh, the war of 71 that led to the liberation of Bangladesh. And my, myself at the time was a young person, I was a student, but I'm I'm, I'm, I would like to make the point that my initial inspiration to, to work on Bangladesh was entirely defined by the shock of the atrocities, which were at that time very well reported in the world press. Uh, subsequent to uh, the start of the Pakistani atrocities against civilians in March of 71, there were many international press reports which, uh, which refer to a case of, of, of genocide and which at some point was, 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 was called the, a worst case scenario of genocide even. So we have to realize that uh, the events of those of years are very deeply uh, um, um, uh, uh, written into the history of Bangladesh as a nation. Let me devote a few points to the question of the international community's responsibility. And I'm doing this because I know the European Parliament has done some exceptionally uh, positive uh, work in the past in recognizing the, uh, the, uh, the validity of the proposition that there should be a trial of war criminals. But if you go back to, into history, to the events of 71, 72, what is most remarkable is that all the efforts that the Bangladesh government at the time, the government of a, of a weak state, inevitably, immediately after liberation, in spite of all the efforts that the Bangladesh government made to bring Pakistani officials, uh, members of the armed forces, to trial, they faltered 
because of a travesty of, of international diplomacy, as it has been called by Bangladeshi intellectuals. Um, many people refer to the fact that there was a Delhi Accord in 73 between the Delhi government and the government of Pakistan. Under this, these accords, um, there was an exchange of POW, POWs, Pakistani POWs at that time staying in, in, in India, and Bangladeshis stranded in Pakistan in very large numbers. Some people refer to a number of 400,000. And the Pakistani government, in relation to the other governments of the subcontinent, was in a position to blackmail both India and Bangladesh, given the fact that there were so many stranded Bangladeshis. Now, the, re the reason why I'm referring back to these historic events is that whereas the Delhi Accord stipulated that at least the most, um, the top uh, officials of the, of the Pakistani army responsible for atrocities would be put on trial, 193 people at, at least, even this demand of the, of the, of the Bangladeshi government was subsequently remained unimplemented. And my reading of history is that the reason why this happened is because there was an insufficient moral commitment by, in particular, by Western states uh, to the issues that were brought onto the table by the Bangladeshi government. As we know, the, the American government, as well as the Chinese government, were on the side of Pakistan, by and large, during 71. And even after 71, Bangladesh government had enormous problems in establishing its own uh, uh, international diplomacy. And in the process, uh, I think many, many errors were, committed, were made by the international community, due to which even the trial of a minimum number that the Bangladesh government wanted to ensure didn't take place. There are two more, two more points that I would like to make in a short introduction. The next point that needs to be uh, repeated, perhaps, because we have already referred to that in the past, is that one of the reasons why today the issue is still of such uh, grave uh, uh, importance for Bangladesh is because of the fact that war criminals were able to reestablish themselves in Bangladeshi politics. And this is a fact that complicates the construction of a democratic state. Because uh, um, war criminals leading a political party that was identified as the main vehicle for the implementation of war crimes by auxiliary forces, because of that force was able to reestablish itself in modernity politics, therefore the construction of a viable democracy remains very complicated for Bangladesh. I now come to the question of the European Parliament's role in addressing the issue. And whereas I've so far had to mention a quite sad point, I think this is the point at which I should express enormous appreciation to the European Parliament. We know that at least on three occasions, the European Parliament has in the past referred to the issue of war criminals in the resolution it has adopted. It did so in 1994, in 2001, and again it did so in 2005. Now, I would like to uh, cite from, in particular from the resolution of 1994, because it indicates the degree to which the Parliament has actually gone to make up for the failure of the international community in the period preceding the 90s. We have the 1994 resolution clause number eight, which states, which calls on the then BNP government to refrain from taking repressive measures against representatives of the Dimul Committee, headed by writer Jahanara Imam, and other organizations which, through democratic means of protest, oppose the killing of students and other civilians by members of the Islamic organization. So the Nimal Committee was given backing by the parliament, which was the committee, the organization, what he was campaigning at the time to, in order to to convince the government of Bangladesh to undertake uh, the trial of war crimes. Secondly, in clause number nine, the parliament stated it supports the demand put forward by the Nimal Committee and other democratic organizations to put Gora Mazom and other representatives of the Islamic organizations on trial, committed during the period of gen genocide. 
So on two counts, the 1994 resolution is a historic resolution because compared to any previous uh, uh, efforts that we might be able to defer to on the part of the international community, the Parliament took a tremendously important step. I think I have to move on fast to, uh, to my conclusions. And before doing so, I think uh, I would like to underline that the fact that we are given so much importance to, in the, uh, to the issue of war crimes doesn't mean that we do not realize that we ignore the fact that there are other outstanding human rights issues for Bangladesh. We know that. Of course, there are extrajudicial, extrajudicial killings by members of the Rapid Action Battalion. There's increasing sexual violence against women. And there are continuing violations of the rights of the indigenous people. So we know there are other problems, outstanding problems, which should not be sidestepped entirely. But on the other hand, we believe that the issue of war crimes is an overarching issue, human rights issue for Bangladesh. And in that sense, I think there is a reason to give special importance to this issue. Now let me uh, conclude with an appeal to the parliament. I think from the discourse, from the statement I have given, uh, it is clear that we, are, we appreciate the parliament for the tremendous uh, for its, 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 its willingness to address the issue on at least three occasions in past resolutions. We are very happy like that. We are happy by, with the democratic spirit that the Parliament has shown uh, in, uh, in upholding the, the demand put forward by the, Bangladeshi, by the Bangladeshi civil society in particular. And we hope that the Parliament will stay by the democratic aspirations of the Bangladeshi people and will follow up with further steps in line with the history of the Parliament's own resolutions. This is what I would like to say as introduction. Thank you. Thank you very much for the, the introduction. Um, I'll say in terms of time, we do need to finish this section by sort of quarter to 10 to 6 by the latest. So if other speakers could bear that in mind. I'd like to move on now to ask um, the prosecutor, Mr. Diadal Malum, to address this briefly, please. Um, Is chair. it possible that Shaira Kobi speaks first? Because in the, in, the, in the comparison what we are saying, it's better to have the background to the trial first before we have the trial itself. Okay, if that's acceptable to our speaker, okay, then we'll ask Mr. Sharif Kampir. Okay, thank you. Yes, thank you, Chairperson. Let me give you a brief introduction about this uh, trial process, about the genocide of Bangladesh. Since the Holocaust of Second World War, the most brutal genocide in the history of mankind took place in Bangladesh during the nine-month-long liberation war of 1971. According to the official statistics, the Pakistani Occupation Army and the local collaborators, mainly Jamaat Islami, Muslim League, and Nizami Islam, killed roughly 3 million unarmed innocent people, sexually harassed 200,000 women, and forced 10 million hapless people to desert the country. More than 2 million people were physically assaulted, and tens of millions were displaced inside the country. The Pakistani occupation forces could never have committed such ruthless genocide crimes against humanity and war crimes had they not been abetted by the killing squad of Razakar, Al-Badr, and Al-Shams formed by Jamaati Islami and their associates. Right after the liberation, family members of three million martyrs of the liberation war, conscious citizens, and the international community sought the trial of those responsible for the cruelest of all genocides in the recent history of the world. The government of Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, which led the liberation war, enacted relevant laws and initiated a process of the trial. After the brutal killing of Bangabandhu in 1975, General Ziaur Rahman annulled the collaborator's order, thereby putting a stop to the trials. Hardly any of the successive governments formed after 1975 were concerned about the trial of war criminals. However, the family members of these three million martyrs who made supreme sacrifice for our liberation 
and other victims of persecution have never backtracked from their demand for the trial of the war criminals. The issue of the trial of those responsible for the genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity committed in Bangladesh is now discussed in the international arena as well, thanks to the common people's persistent demand for their trial and civil society's constant agitation against them. The Grand Alliance, led by Sheikh Hasina, enjoyed a historical victory in the parliamentary election held in 29 December 2008, mainly because of its commitment for the trial of the war criminals of 1971. When the government initiated the trial process, Jamaat Islami and its close ally, BNP, have opposed by saying that in the name of the trial of war criminals, the government is trying to eliminate the opposition. The leaders of Jamaat Islami have had never admitted that the genocide of 1971 was abetted by them. In order to disrupt the ongoing trial, Jamaat has started a systematic propaganda based on falsehood, which had created a lot of confusion among the people. Certain human rights bodies also became victim of such baseless Jamaati propaganda. While observing concern from a couple of international human rights watchdogs, we, the representatives of the civil society and the victims of war, would like to state that ongoing trial of the killers and collaborators of Bangladesh is a result of our demand and cry for justice. Those crimes committed during the war of 1971 were targeted against the people of Bangladesh. We have our own law and legal jurisprudence to try those criminals. In every country, indeed, judiciary is independent. It is the state that set up tribunals, courts, and appoints judges, prosecution team, and investigation body to conduct a fair trial. In the history of the war crimes trials, there is not a single example that is beyond controversy. There is hardly any evidence that the criminals admitted their crimes and welcomed the trial process. We appreciate international communities' observations as also their close monitoring, but any kind of interference in our internal matter that will hinder the trial process as well as frustrate the victims, those who are crying for justice for the last 40 years. In order to save mankind from the curse of war, those who committed genocide, war crimes, and crimes against humanity, crimes against peace, have brought to book the pain and grievances of the victims will be redressed to a great extent if the criminals are severely punished. This step is necessary not only to get penance from the past sin, but also to put an end to the cycle of sorrows and sufferings related to the war atrocities. Scholars have argued that war crimes trials begin a long process of peace and reconciliation with the past. If nothing is done, to condemn the war crimes, not only will a culture of impunity arise and may encourage further crimes, but cycles of deep resentment in the victimized population may lead to further conflict. And now Bangladesh is trying to come out from the culture of impunity that your, the chairperson mentioned about Nepal. It is very much important in the case of Bangladesh also. This trial process is going to end the culture of impunity in Bangladesh, as well as the other countries that are still waiting for the justice, justice for the victims of the genocide. That will also be encouraged by if we could successfully, successfully complete the trial process. And we also hope from the you know, European Union, as well as the other international community, the chairperson has mentioned about the genocide of Bangladesh. If it is possible, we plead you to recognize the genocide of Bangladesh in the European Parliament. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think it's a very passionate plea which you know, people here well understand. So who is your... Okay. <laughs> right. So I'm now allowed to, to move on to third representative in this section, um, our prosecutor, Mr. Amalu. Oh, thank you. First of all, let me thank the European Parliament, member of its South Asian delegation, for allowing me to speak before you and also for your continued support for the justice process in Bangladesh. 
I recall with appreciation of the European Parliament's resolution in 2005 reiterating support the demand that those known to have participated in the massacre of Bangladeshi citizens and other war crimes during Bangladesh Liberation War 1971 be brought to trial. I thank you for that. Honorable Chair, as you uh, mentioned, our ICT Act 1973. The Act 1973 and setting the International Crimes Tribunal. As you are aware, I took for, uh, it took 41 years to initiate the justice process to end impunity for core international crimes committed in 1971. The newly independent government of Bangladesh passed a law called International Crimes Tribunal Act 1973 to investigate and prosecute the, the person responsible for genocide, crimes against humanity, war crimes, and other crimes under international law committed in 1971. The act is a complete law in itself, providing the substantive law, definition of the <coughs> judges to be independent and to ensure fair trial standards, including the rights of the accused, rules to monitor investigation and interrogation, supervising arrest, validity of continued detention, rules to protect the witnesses, victim rules regarding appeals after conviction, and the rules making authority, the judges, etc. <sighs> the judges protection team and investigation agency. Under the ICT Act 1973, International Crimes Tribunal was set up by the government of Bangladesh in March 2010. When the judges of the tribunal were appointed, two of these judges are serving judges of the Supreme Court of Bangladesh, the highest apex court of our country. And the third judge, with 30 years trial court experience at the district court level and qualified to be the judge of the Supreme Court. At the same time, the government set up the prosecution team and the investigation agency the tribunal and appointed prosecutor in investigation, respectively. Case before the tribunal. Eight separate cases are now being tried before the International Crimes Tribunal. All cases are is at different stage of the legal process. Currently, witnesses are being heard by the tribunal in one case in which the accused has been indicted, while the six other cases are in their charge framing stage, which is stays prior to the indictment. In one case, the accused is still being investigated. <laughs> True nature of this justice process. It is important that we understand the true nature of the ongoing process. The act itself is a domestic law passed by the Parliament of Bangladesh Indeed, to be clarified that this justice process was never part of any intervention by the international community, nor a result of any international compromise, unlike most just, uh, justice initiative of its kind and have taken place in the international arena. The justice process, that is, this act invites setting up is purely a domestic process, which means as I need to categorically stress, this tribunal in Bangladesh is not an international tribunal. The only international element in the scheme of, this, of things is the nature of the offense, that is the international crimes. Although these crimes, due to their nature and trajectory of development, have historically been a part of the international criminal law, 1973, in tarnished these crimes and thus made them a part of the jurisprudence of the tribunal and Bangladesh legal system. Independence of the tribunal and the presumption of innocence. The tribunal is independent and the judges of the tribunal are qualified, uh, required by the law to ensure the fair trial. The accused individual are presumed innocent until proven guilty beyond reasonable doubt. Chas is the high threshold of the guilt of which this process has to be adhered to. 
All of which you have. Uh, yeah, during your liberation, you state, uh, mention in our law, there is the only provision of death penalty. Uh, may I uh, clarify, uh, try to clarify or the uh, position from your statute? Uh, that is not the last position to penalize any, uh, in, a, in any judgment. The judgment of the tribunal as to the guilt or innocent of any accused person shall give reason on which it is based, provided that each member of the tribunal shall copy or deliver judgment of his own. Upon conviction of an, uh, an accused person, the tribunal shall award sentence of death or such other punishment proportionate to the gravity of the crimes as appear to the tribunal to be just and proper. The sentence awarded under this act shall be carried out in accordance with the orders of the government. The death penalty, not the, uh, uh, the uh, last and the end. Uh, Honorable Chair, just uh, I'm going to uh, uh, conclude my uh, presentation. The law provides that the accused who are under investigation could be interrogated by the investigator and the prosecutor. However, according to the law, any statement under or information given by the accused during such interrogation cannot be used against the accused or adduced evidence during the trial. Through this, the law protects the accused from self-incrimination and effective removes the incentives for the corrosive treatment of the accused while granting the permission to interrogate. The tribunal has repeatedly stays on putting in, in place such extraordinary mechanisms which are not frozen in the act, not practiced or available for other accused in Bangladesh, and finally, not even provided to the accused in any other South Asian countries during every investigation, the tribunal ordered that the accused counsel and a doctor be present at the place of interrogation, at the place of interrogation, and both the lawyer and doctors will be allowed to consult with and examine the accused during interval. The judges of the tribunal as a practice have been very restrictive in granting such interrogation. The prosecution and in investigation are only allowed to interrogate the accused only once, and the two for a limited hour during the day set by the tribunal. In one case, tribunal allowed such an interrogation, but required that the same has to be take place in the comfort of the home of the accused where he was on bail. In the presence of his physician and lawyer, I do not know whether it in any other jurisdiction, the judges have allowed the interrogation to take place under such condition. This is how the accused individuals are treated by the International Crimes Tribunal of Bangladesh. Bangladesh has a <clears throat> well-established and smooth-functioning legal system and this legal culture which shares the heritage with the other Commonwealth nations. The international community had never any reason to be concerned about the standard of Bangladesh legal system as evidenced from the numerous reports, the justice process facilitated by the International Crimes Tribunal in like 1973 and by the International Crimes Tribunal, as you may say, a part or any extension of that this legal heritage, a prosecutor and as an advocate who has over 30 years of the legal practice in Bangladesh, as a human rights lawyer and defender who has spent most of his life and career defending the right of the others, I can assure you that my team members and I are all committed to do best to ensure justice that is not for the victims only but also for the accused. 
in that we need for understanding and support as you have extended in the past. We do understand that a meeting as a brief as this may not be sufficient to explain a justice process nor a understanding it fully. So please do not hesitate to direct your queries, comments, and concern to the prosecution team of the National Crimes Tribunal, to which we would be happy to respond. We are aware that a momentous task we all have undertaken to end the impunity that lasted 40 years. That is why we appreciate and value such suggestion. Thank you for your time and attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, and also thank you for the offer, um, you know, that if there are further questions that we have after today, that we, we, can, we can take those up. Um, I think the last speaker coming from Bangladesh is Dr. Turina Flox. Thank you, Madam Chair. Honorable Chair, Her Excellency, Madam Ambassador of the Government of Bangladesh, respected members of the European Parliament, Friends, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for giving me an opportunity to speak here today. Now, my presentation, as the time limit states, is a five minutes. I'd try to be uh, within that five minutes time. So I, uh, my presentation would have two parts. First part, I'd be discussing and highlighting the challenges that the trial is currently facing at the international community or international level. And moving on from there to a very specific area, trial of rapes and other sexual violence crimes committed by Pakistan Army and its local collaborators in 1971. So to start with the challenges that the trial is facing at this moment uh, from the international community can be divided into three broader parts. The first part is on the criticism on the legal, uh, the legislation, rules and regulation itself. The second criticism or uh, the attack comes on the legal process that is being faced. And the third one, essentially a political, both at the national and the international level. Now, with the law and legislation, uh, there has been a lot of discussion on whether the law complies with the international standard, whether the rules of procedure which are followed, the rules of evidence are up to the standard that the international community following. Now, uh, what I submit here today is that international standard itself is a fluid concept. There is no foolproof legislation, legislative standard available in the, in the international field. We do see the ICTY trial are going on, ICTR going on, even the trial at the ICC, all are under three different pieces of legislation. I mean, on broader sense, there are similarities, but there are bits and bits of differences here and there. Nevertheless, the international community has accepted such trials and supporting it. So in that context, when I look at the Bangladesh 1973 Act, it itself does comply with the international standard within the broader uh, sense. Uh, the two main issues of fairness and independence of the forum, both are uh, guaranteed in the legislation. Therefore, the community uh, that is criticizing that uh, it's not up to the standard, I think that is baseless. And with that, uh, there is uh, I would just like to refer, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the complementary uh, rule of the ICC, which actually encourages uh, the domestic courts to go ahead with the trial of war criminals or the criminals which com committed uh, uh, crimes against humanity or genocide. And also, not only under the ICC, it has been a long established internationally legal principle under rules of jurisprudence that it is stated that certain heinous crimes like genocide Side, him, uh, crimes against humanity. I mean, every country does have universal jurisdiction to try those. So in that context, uh, my reply to the first set of uh, criticism, as far as the law and the rules is concerned, I think it's baseless. Moving on to the second uh, area of criticism that relates to the uh, legal process, and uh, there are uh, there are criticism you, you will be uh, seeing in different various uh, international uh, reports and certain, certain times uh, from various parts that the preparation uh, preparation time is less, the bail provisions are not proper, there's no interlocutory appeals, a defense office has not been set up. Now, every court, I mean, to start with uh, trying the international 
international, uh, international courts or hybrid courts to start with trying the criminals of uh, war crimes, genocide, or crimes against humanity. It needs time. It needs time to settle down. And we just uh, established the court in just one and a half year ago, just almost two years ago. We, have, we can see in Balkan courts, it has been long time that even though there are expert judges and expert uh, lawyers are there, but still the court is taking time to settle down. So is the case with the Cambodia. Five years have been gone, and then there are uh, problems with settling down the court. In that context, I would say we just need some time to call the tribunal to settle down, and there is always ample opportunity to uh, make uh, necessary changes, reforms in the rules and regulation. Moving on to the third part of the uh, criticism, which is essentially a political one. It, it, there's a link between national and the international politics. Now, it says that this is a tribunal where the government is trying to victimize the opposition uh, uh, from, uh, to oust them from the politics. Now, even if, even if, uh, ladies and gentlemen, even if that is the case, but we have to understand it is a legal process. It's a trial going on in an open court. There are so many examples of a trial being taken place in a camera situation where the international community are totally shut up. Now, in Bangladesh, when we are looking at at the trial, it's an open one. So therefore, even if there is a political motivation regarding trying of the war criminals, at the end of the day, it is essentially a legal one. So therefore, there is every opportunity for the defense to come forward. There's every opportunity to everyone really uh, situate their position and argue the best for each one of them. Having said so, now, uh, to the second part of my presentation, that is the trial of rapes and other sexual violence crimes committed by Pakistan Army and its local collaborators in 1971. Now, ladies and gentlemen and Madam Chair, this is always the case. Women are the worst victim in any armed conflict situation. And so Bangladesh in 1971 was not an exception to that. There are so many cases of rapes and uh, sexual slavery and uh, uh, enforced pregnancy. There are evidences available on that. Now, to start with, there is one little hunch with that. There is a number dispute that has been uh, created when there was a Hamidur Rahman commission set up by Pakistan government and saying that not so many rapes did take place. Government is uh, like actually saying more figure than the actual one. Now, uh, Madam Chair, is it at all possible to actually give an account of the actual rape victims, be it in the peacetime or in the wartime, the government only can give or disclose the official data. There's so many middle class rape victims who have never come under the so-called official uh, uh, support system. Therefore, their number is not an issue here. What is important that we have to appreciate that the rape, sexual slavery, and forced pregnancy, all these uh, offenses, sexual violence committed against the Bengali women in 1971. Now, two important challenges that really that is related to the trial of these rape victims the first and foremost is there is difficulties in investigation of the rape uh, cases and uh, this is uh, madam chair is uh, very common to any society whether it is underdeveloped developing or a developed one rape victims take time to come out and speak and there are a lot of evidence lost and considering the fact that the trial is taking place after 40 years of happening of those crimes, then it makes the case more uh, difficult. But then again, it is actually a common phenomena, even in the ICC trial, we have seen in Katanga case and in the Dailo Lubanga case, that both these cases, sexual violence uh, charges were had to be dropped at the last moment because of difficulties in investigation. So Bangladesh trying those is definitely one area that we understand, appreciate there are challenges. And the last one, and that leads that will lead to my conclusion. There is an ongoing international conspiracy going on to deny the history of 1971, more in the cases of rape victims, the victims of sexual slavery and enforced pregnancy. Now, Madam Chair, I'd just like to remind you that Holocaust denial is illegal in a number of European countries. Many countries also have broader laws that criminalize genocide denial. In addition, the European Union has issued a directive to combat racism and xenophobia, which makes provision for member states criminalizing Holocaust denial with a maximum prison sentence of between one and three years. Now, at this stage, when there's international conspiracy going on, denying the history of 1971, I think the Bangladesh at this moment should be having a law uh, like denial of Holocaust 
as making it an uh, illegal one. So denial of 1971 situation could be uh, termed as an illegal one in Bangladesh. And now I would like to conclude um, uh, to say that, uh, Madam Chair, it's a call of humanity, peace, and justice that the South Asian region does gender justice to the millions of victims of sexual violence crimes during armed conflicts. The cause of no Ferdosi Priyobhashini, the lady, the first, uh, uh, the first woman who was a rape victim of 1971 has actually publicly narrated her story of sufferings. Uh, so I say that the cause of no Ferdosi Priyobhashini of Bangladesh, no Raja Begum of Kashmir, or no Ida Carmelita of Sri Lanka should be left unattended. I conclude with an emotional note. When I was coming to represent uh, Bangladesh in this hearing, I, uh, uh, Mrs. Fedosi Priyobhashini has given me a gift. That is the sari that I'm wearing today. She says that when you, when you stand, you speak for us, and this sari is a symbol of a lot of millions of victims of Bangladesh who want justice, and we want all of you to be our side and to get us the justice in this matter. Uh, thank you so much. <coughs>
Bangladesh has an international obligation to bring an end to a culture and a long period of impunity. And I would not be an international lawyer if I was to say anything other than that. It would also be hugely inappropriate for me or, or any of the, the team that I work with to try and minimize the level of victimization from the 1971 conflict. It is not for me to say whether there were 300,000 or 3 mil million deaths. If there were 300,000 deaths, this requires a judicial process. If there are 3 million victims, this requires a judicial process. It is quite right that the world has not seen a conflict like Bangladesh, and that's for that reason why it's so important that this is addressed now, albeit 40 years late. And, and I sympathize with those who have spoken today that it's taken 40 years to do this, and that's unfortunate. It should have been done a long time ago. Having said that, mm -hmm. there is an international obligation to bring these trials to justice, but there is also an obligation to do it properly. I will repeat what one of the other speakers said earlier, in that the international community is partially at fault, and the international community now has an obligation to ensure that Bangladesh is able to bring these trials to justice properly. The comment as to international standards, I fully agree with the previous speaker that it's a very fluid subject and one that cannot be easily defined. Having said that, I do not agree that the 1973 Act and the current legislative framework meets what I would understand to be international standards, international standards of due process. There are a number of areas of, of the legislative framework that prevents the tribunal from holding trials in accordance with fair trial guarantees. It's not enough to say that the crimes that were committed were horrendous, which they were. It is all the more important that those who may ultimately face the death penalty receive a fair trial beyond reproach. That means that they have to be able to challenge the jurisdiction of the tribunal, they have to be able to challenge the appointment of an individual judge if there is a legitimate basis for making that complaint, and they have to have the opportunity to challenge interlocutory decisions of the tribunal. They also have to enjoy the fundamental principles that the Bangladesh Constitution provides for citizens charged with any other criminal offence. In these trials, they do not have those luxuries. We have repeatedly stated that the first and the 15th constitutional amendment should be repealed. We have repeatedly stated that the, the Act, the 1973 Act, needs to be amended in order that certain uh, areas of the Act including the definition of crimes, should be amended. And I agree with the learned prosecutor who said that this is not an international tribunal. He's quite correct. It is not an international tribunal. It is a national tribunal or is a, a domestic court. However, one of the major concerns that we have repeatedly expressed is that you have to decide on which side of the fence you fall. If you're an international tribunal, you need to apply international norms. And if you're a national tribunal, you have to apply domestic law. You cannot restrict fundamental rights, and you cannot remove the protection of domestic procedural laws, as is the case with this tribunal. Even if you are a domestic court, you cannot forget the international obligations that you have as a signatory to the Rome Statute. And you cannot forget the fact that you are a signatory to the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Bangladesh is a state party to both of those treaties, as well as a number of other international treaties that it is required to adhere to. My plea is for the European Parliament in its, its delegation to Bangladesh to raise these issues, to ensure that this tribunal proceeds in, in in a way which ensures fair trials of these accused so that the real victims of 1971 can see justice and that this is not all held in vain. Thank you very much.
Thank you. I'd like to thank all our speakers for th their clarity. And I think you know, what we now have is, um, together with the materials in our dossiers, um, a very clear sort of outline. Of course, what we're now having as well is um, an issue of time constraint because we do have one other item that we want to spend a few minutes on. Um, I don't know if members have questions. Yes, Ms. Hibner. And then we will hear from EAS, the ambassador, of course. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Najważniejszym przesłaniem, które chciałabym. Thank you very much. I think the most important message that I'd like to state here, on my own behalf and on behalf of my colleagues, is that no war criminal, regardless of whether they killed one person or more people, no war criminal should be unpunished. This is the most important message. In this world, we will not tolerate impunity like this. You can't forget such crimes. What I heard today about the 40 years between 71 and 2011, that these crimes went unpunished, I think this is unforgivable. I come from a country where very recently such trials were held in 1980. There was martial law introduced in Poland. People were killed. And the people who introduced martial law have been punished, have been pronounced guilty. They are now old people. But what is important is that they are not unpunished. Society will not tolerate a situation where people who committed such crimes will go unpunished. We are not in favour of impunity. However, in this situation, should we, however, apply death penalty? We didn't give life. We can't take it away. Maybe instead of death penalty, maybe we should apply life imprisonment. This is also a penalty, punishment. Please do bear this in mind. Life, life is something that you cannot take away, I believe. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Ms. Hibner. Were there other comments or questions that people wished, wished to raise? I mean, I, I have some, but I have other opportunities to, to raise them. So if not, I mean, let's, and as we're running short, let's take um, the External Action Service and then come back to the Ambassador, of course. Thank you, Madam Chairperson. I'll try to stick to the five-minute uh, slot. Uh, may, allow me to say a few words about the context. Uh, uh, it is well known that the key EU priorities uh, in Bangladesh are the consolidation of its democracy and poverty alleviation. And we believe that for that, and we have raised it with the government of Bangladesh, um, a number of policies, including vigorous social reforms, the fight against inequality and extreme poverty, and the strict application of the rule of law are key to a democratic and stable Bangladesh. This includes the accountability of all those having held power in the past or now. Uh, we also believe that the international community needs to help Bangladesh uh, to avoid the risk of confrontation uh, on, in the way up to the uh, 2014 elections. Uh, specifically on war crimes, uh, we understand that the importance that justice has for the people of Bangladesh and the relevance of these trials as part of a national healing process. Like the rest of the world, we are also aware of the complexities surrounding these proceedings. If the judiciary of Bangladesh uh, is of the view that a number of individuals have to answer for crimes perpetrated in the past, uh, it is for us to respect this view. It will not be a surprise, uh, and uh, I welcome the statement made uh, by the Honourable Member of Parliament that our main objection uh, to these trials is the possible application of the death penalty. Since we have a principled position on this issue, the EU advocates its universal and definitive abolition, even in the case of the worst crimes. Together with Bangladesh, we are strong supporters of the UN system and of international standards of due process 
as reflected in the ICCPR, ratified by Bangladesh as well as by all EU member states. We therefore strongly encourage respect for these principles uh, in accordance with the values that we both share. The question of war crimes trials has been raised uh, in the context of our regular dialogue with the Bangladeshi authorities. And the Bangladeshi authorities, and in this uh, I come to the point uh, made by our honorable guest, have not requested uh, the involvement of the European Union in this legal process in any way. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, that clarification from our External Action Service. Ambassador, um, if you'd like to take the floor. Uh, sorry, I have one question. Can I ask you very shortly? Yes, my question is Mr. Catman. You said that so, in the... Um, sorry. No, you can't. I'm sorry. We have 10 minutes left, and we have to hear from the Ambassador, and we have another item on the agenda. So the questions come from the members. I'm sorry. Ambassador. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I do know that I have time constraint, but I'll try to run over my uh, speaking notes. First, let me say that how much I welcome this opportunity to participate in this important dialogue, because I believe that any dialogue for that matter uh, are important as they help in clarifying uh, doubts and misconceptions and thereby promote better understanding of seemingly complex issues. Madam Chair, you may please recall that I have had uh, some earlier opportunities to inform you about the Bangladesh government's total commitment to a fair, transparent, and independent trial of those responsible for war crimes committed during our liberation war in 1971. Uh, I'm sure our discussion today would further provide you and others present with a more focused and clearer understanding of the subject particularly when we have the presence amongst us of some personalities who have been long associated with the issue and also some have traveled from Dhaka and we have heard from them. Uh, in your introductory remarks as well, Madam uh, Chair, you have uh, mentioned uh, about the trial process. I need not go into the details and the preceding speakers have also uh, set the tone of a discussion by giving both the historic perspective as well as the different aspects of the tribunal, uh, tribunal itself, the, um, the provisions, the composition, the purpose, and the rules of procedures. We have heard uh, the, one of the prosecutors uh, here also. And um, uh, um, Madam Afros has also, or she has also referred to some concerns which are genuinely heard. I should say that uh, whether the tribunal is compatible to international standards or not, whether it is politically motivated, and what and if there have been attempts to derail uh, the process and through denial of uh, the genocide itself. These are questions that will come up, and we are ready to answer and to substantiate that the government is fully committed. And with that uh, in mind, it had set up the tribunal to punish the Bangladeshis who collaborated as auxiliary forces with the occupation forces in committing crimes against uh, uh, humanity during the Bangladesh Liberation War. Well, as a pluralistic democracy, Bangladesh is committed to uphold the people's uh, will, and uh, there is an overwhelming public support for the trial, a trial which is long overdue. The civil society also stands firmly behind the trial, and the ongoing trial of the war criminals is particularly of great importance to the millions of victims who deserve justice, which has been long denied and, I should say, far too long. We have heard this from all the speakers, and uh, including Mr. Toby Cadman, who has been here. He did also underline that aspect that there is an international obligation for Bangladesh to bring uh, the trial of those uh, criminals uh, to justice. And, um, and of course, he has also said that this needs to be done properly. And this is where I would emphasize that our government is fully determined of its responsibility. And that's the reason it took some time in, uh, in following up on its electoral pledge. It could have um, uh, 
done immediately with through a summary justice without any formal trial or simply through a show of stage managed trial. But uh, the government had opted for a judicial process and took the time to ensure that there is no lapse of rule, rule of law and human rights. Well, Madam Chair, uh, the 73 War Crime Act was reviewed and amended to reflect the developments in international laws and the recommendations of the UN Rules of Procedure for investigation, prosecution, trial of offenses. The present act is therefore in conformity with the universally recognized standards and norms ensuring full respect of the rights of the accused. And of course, we have heard the trial is transparent and independent. Observers, including international observers, are able to watch the trial. And unlike in the Nuremberg trials, there are provisions for appeals and the judgment is subject to review. Having said so, Madam Chair, I'd like to underline that the trial should not be seen as a victor's justice. It must not also be misconstrued, if I may use that word, as an exercise in vendetta and being politically motivated, as unfortunately some quarters may try to portray. On the contrary, it is a clear and genu genuine case of criminal justice. Our Prime Minister, in her speech at the last UNGA session, had uh, said, and let me quote, that there can be no peace without justice. The eventual punishment of the war criminals will strengthen our democracy, demonstrating that the state is capable of just retribution. And of course, as a state party to the International Criminal Court's uh, statute also. We believe in the statute's provision of bringing perpetrators to justice. It is the only way to healing the wrongs of the past and bring national reconciliation. We have heard uh, the same uh, line of thinking throughout the discussions today. I just thought, you know, I need to highlight it uh, once more. What we need is cooperation of all uh, in completing the trial to establish the rule of law in the country. And Madam Chair, um, some may say that why is the trial carried out after so many years? Why not just forgive and forget and reconcile? From the viewpoint of restorative justice, our position is that for war crimes or crimes against humanity, there is no time limits for trials in these cases. The, tra tra the trial of the Nazi war criminals continues till to date. In case of Bangladesh, attempts to hold the trials began with the promulgation, promulgation of the collaborators' order in 1972. But for reason that is uh, perhaps well known, it had to stop after the assassination of the father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, in 1975. But Although delayed justice has denied justice for 40 long years, the present government is trying to heal the wound by ensuring, uh, and it's not trying to create new ones, by ensuring justice, and it's not trying to create new, new wounds. And uh, recently, we had a national dialogue in Bangladesh on trial of the crimes against humanity and ensuring transparency, accountability, and due process of law. Uh, well, Madam Chair, what we would like to see is that, just to conclude, that the trial of war criminals of 1971 have enjoyed the support of this August body, the European Parliament. Mentions have been made to, of three resolution. I'm fully aware of this, and I, as you know, we have discussed this. Uh, and I do appreciate, on the other hand, that genuine concern raised that the trial must be fair and independent. This is also something that the people and the government of Bangladesh would like to see. And also at the risk of repeating, let me say that the entire nation wants to come out from the culture of impunity. And uh, we'd like to see that the trial is maintaining the fairness, transparency, and the international standard at, as it is doing now. And uh, we'd earnestly hope that the European Parliament would remain steadfast in its support for Bangladesh government's efforts to put on trial those responsible for the massacres 
of 1971. And um, Madam Chair, I just would like to refer to the issue of death penalty. And I'm, I'm very well aware about uh, European Union's position on death penalty. But it is also true that there is no global consensus uh, on against death penalty yet. Uh, notably, the ICC statute has not rejected application by states of penalties prescribed by the national law. Therefore, the ICC statute also recognizes the rights of the state parties to provide penalties different from the statute. Having said so, uh, in contemplation of death penalty in the national law, that is the 1973 Act, under which the ICT Bangladesh has been constituted does not seem to be incompatible with present international standard. Uh, I was a little taken aback that you know we are we are discussing the issue of penalties in this uh, act, where what we are now doing is the matter is rather subjudice. We are uh, continuing on the trial uh, process, and I believe that you know any. Um, further preconceived uh, notion about the penalties that are enacted might interfere with the legal process that is currently ongoing and it might also derail from the substance of uh, prosecution. So I believe that perhaps this is not really the right time when we can discuss the penalties. We are discussing the process that we meet out fair judgment and fairness is done to the perpetrators if they are found guilty. So the issue I don't think really uh, warrants to be discussed here. With, I say this with all uh, respect to uh, Madam Chair and also to the position that European Union maintains on that particular issue. Thank you very much and uh, I'll be open to any questions and queries and I'd also ask uh, the um, those uh, who have come from Bangladesh and to the uh, uh, distinguished prosecutor uh, to assist in answering any queries that uh, may be raised during in course of the time that is left. Sorry if I have gone a little beyond uh, the five minutes limit, but it's an important issue which demands uh, some elaborate uh, comments. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ambassador. I mean, you not the only one who might have gone longer than five minutes this afternoon, I feel. Um, which I think, you know, and it's a pity that time is now catching up on us. I want to say one or two words on that, and then I just want to spend a couple of minutes very briefly on one of the big issues in Sri Lanka at the moment. That, um, I mean, the issue about the death penalty, I mean, it, you know, what we're aware of is it's on the statute books. We're not saying this is necessarily the outcome, where it's aware it's on the statute books. You know it's an issue for us. We raised it last time we were in Bangladesh with the Honourable Sheikh Hasina herself. Um, so, you know, this is one of the issues that we, we have been talking about. And I'm also interested as well in, and very pleased in certain of the things that have been said about, you, you know, the right to appeal, etc. And, of course, you know, we're aware that the trial is, is open and we would hope that, indeed, there would be a number of observers at it who, you know, because this is... Um, an issue of considerable um, interest, as you will be aware, not least for this parliament, even if um, you know, we've been a little short of members this afternoon. But it's certainly something that we'll be coming back to, I think, you know, just to update members as to, to what has been happening there. That um, I wanted to just very briefly touch, because I'm aware that time is, is beating us, um, just to draw people's attention um, to... Uh, an important event in Sri Lanka recently.